never had a chance to meet Lee. So today they met for the first time. They've had a chance to talk a little bit. So I'd like to just have him, not too detailed, but get into some of that moment in time. It's unique for our SF history. And then Yvette and him will come back and we'll talk about Roy through his daughter. And there's some great stories that none of us have heard, but when we hear him, we'll love him. So first set the stage for that day, because that is the critical moment in time. First part of setting that stage, if you can get your hands on one of these, they're out of print. This is absolutely phenomenal history, and the sections that I'm going to talk about, the whole part, including Roy's experiences in this book. His entire back of the book is a Medal of Honor citation, a photograph that is most commonly uh, seen. And of course, this is after uh, he was severely wounded. And uh, as you've already heard, my mission and our team was to support that special projects team. We weren't allowed to mention numbers, names, or anything. It did leak out that, that it was probably Project Sigma operating. Well, we didn't know what Sigma was. Our job is out here. We were the nuts and bolts of an A-team. And then <clears throat> when the operation first started, they launched from our landing strip, which ironically was almost a mile long, and it wasn't dirt, it wasn't pavement, it was mostly steel tarmac put down. So we sort of, our nickname was the Country Club A Camp of Vietnam. <laughs> the French, that was their headquarters for all of their rubber plantations yep. in South Vietnam prior to World War II. And they got kicked out by the Japanese, and then they moved back in uh, after the war, and then eventually left uh, uh, South Vietnam, or <coughs> Vietnam altogether. And uh, the airstrip was there. Now it was finished off with the metal by U.S. forces, but the old headquarters, including the French mansion, our swimming pool, we had access to a swimming pool. How many A-camps had a swimming pool to go to? <laughs> they produced ice force. How many had to wait for a long time to get a few ice cubes to chill your beer? And we had it all. So it was called the Country Club. And in fact, the first 97 days that I was in that camp, we got one KIABC. And he didn't have a weapon. He walked in the middle of an ambush and he got shot. So. I'm thinking, well, this is a pretty cool camp. I can skate through this because guys can get hurt. You know, bullets hurt, fragmentation hurts, bad guys are everywhere. And I look a lot different than him, so I'm easily picked out. And that's when I went from being his height down here because the tall guys are always the ones getting shot. <laughs> but anyway, leading up to this, we started picking up more activity than ever before. And we were starting to hear from some of our friends that did talk to us about across the border. And then the night before uh, Roy's team came in, uh, we were informed we will have visitors. Uh, it's very classified to talk about it and don't mingle with them. Well, that just opened the door for Lee Martin. And so I was out there looking to see if there was anybody I knew. And then they launched. <coughs> And uh, I won't get into a lot of the details of what happened across the fence, but uh, shortly after one of their launches, uh, our radio started going crazy. We were picking up some of their helicopter talk. They were talking about KIA's wounded, and they, they needed help, bring it in. So I started uh, automatically, standard procedure in our camp, knowing the people in camp that were good and healthy, draw a pint or so of whole blood, keep it on ice, ready to go. That's much better than serum albumin or anything else you can give somebody who's lost blood, if that's the same blood type. Not realizing and thinking, those guys going across fence probably didn't wear dog tags. So <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't really work. But I made the offer, and your medics knew it, and some of it was used for some of their other wounded. Um, but then <clears throat> the worst part was that, that uh, some of the rescue helicopters were coming back. They were shot up, really shot up. Have you ever seen a Huey fly without having its windshield left because it's been blown out? Uh, it's amazing. Trailing smoke, fuel, whatever, 
just skid landing, quite with a crash landing on the end of the airstrip right by our camp. And <clears throat> then bodies started being taken off. Some were already in body bags. And that sort of puzzled me. You know, they had the time to put the body bags, uh, put these men in the body bags and so on. But they were still taking the ones I had brought out and using them for, for other people. The thing that really started this whole part was one of those <coughs> team members that had gone out went to one of the body bags and he unzipped it because it had been zipped <coughs> closed. It's airtight when your zip's shut. He unzipped it and he started cursing and screaming and yelling and kicking the body. And, Boy, that's pretty disrespectful to one of my brothers. And then he reaches down, phenomenal strength, he sort of picked it up and dumped it into our drainage ditch right beside our airstrip cursing. Well, then a couple of his other buddies run over there and they're unzipping bags and they're dumping these guys out. They were NVA. They were not our guys. Body bags have been left, airdropped, whatever, however <coughs> guys, we don't know. I've never heard that story. But when they came to locked in, they were in bags that were zipped. And they were sort of lined up three times from here to the wall from where I'm standing. And I'm just watching this. I'm an observer. And within three or four feet, was, I think it was the last one. I, I, I'm not 100% sure. My memory's not good enough to remember if there were more behind me, but I don't think so. I kind of stayed out of the way. And there, there was one, and, and it just seemed a little larger than the rest. I mean, I'm not, I won't go into why I think it was larger. But um, their medic was then checking out everything. Now, I thought he was an MD because everybody called him Doc. They called most of us medics in A-camps Boxy, which does translate to doctor. So Doc's going down, and, and, and he's, oh, here's another one. They dump him off. Well, here's one that wasn't, or a couple that weren't. And finally, he gets down to basically the last one. And he kneels down, and he just tenses up. And he just starts shaking. He says, oh my God, no, it can't be. He says, this is Benavides. Benavides, he wasn't on the mission. Well, it's because he jumped on a helicopter to go help his buddies when they knew they were in trouble. Nobody even knew. Well, what was he wearing? The basic fatigues that you wear in the rear area. They had a 45 holster on, no 45. Uh, I'd heard that he also had a knife. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I'm, I moved up so that I'm approximately this far from the medic with the body bag here, and I'm looking, and he was crying, a couple other guys were starting to come over, and um, then he just tensed up, just, I mean, really tense, looking down, kneeling down, of course, and I was trying to look over his shoulder, and he said, he's alive, and, and looking, he unzipped the bag a little more, and I didn't want to see what was the rest of it, because he was severely hurt. I'm, I'm sorry, God, I try not to be too brutal, but all I could see that he was looking, but between teeth, and I don't know if they were dentures that he had or artificial, because some were broken, you could just barely see a little, almost like a worm, but not like that. It was flat-sided, wiggling. Now, dead men tongues don't wiggle. I know that for a medical fact. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I just don't do that. And so now we realize he is alive. Not much for vital signs. We had a stethoscope on checking every one of them. And he was the only one authorized to actually close the bag. Once that bag's closed, your fate is sealed. And so, the next thing I know, we're trying to get some IV started, that was almost next impossible. The key was just to get him out of there, get him to an American hospital. And it looked like a, a, a line of, of funeral people who carried caskets. They grabbed that body bag, and there was a helicopter right there, and he was rotating full bore, and you couldn't, didn't want to get underneath it too much, it'd blow you off your feet. And 
So he was gone. I had no idea who your father was at that time. You had no idea. And secondly, I said, they're wasting the trip. Nobody can live through those kinds of wounds. I was wrong. Thank God. What a blessing. He survived. 